Howdy folks! Welcome back to the Steampunk Desperado channel. This is the place for all things sci-fi and fantasy, with a special emphasis on that greatest of all genres, steampunk. Today, we're going to go a little far afield into literature that's not even sci-fi. Because in my recent kick on to reading military sci-fi, which I did in a recent video, today I'm looking at military stories that are not sci-fi. I'm not saying fiction because not all of them are fiction. Some are non-fiction, but they're all told with a narrative style. Now, it's interesting. Although I did read a lot of books about war because I've, I've always been a history buff, uh, I didn't read much, if any, military fiction growing up. And uh, that was partly because of the Vietnam War. kind of left, left a bad taste in everybody's mouth. And uh, although at the time I was against the war as well, I don't want to diss the guys who did go because you know, a lot of them were drafted and, and those who volunteered probably felt they were doing the right thing, even though you know, in retrospect I think the, the inter intervention was ill-advised. Uh, nonetheless, uh, I did read a lot of things about war, such as Sun Tzu's famous uh, Art of War, uh, published in the 5th century BC, a lot of it which still holds true today, and uh, Karl von Clausewitz is on war from the early 1800s, things like that, but I didn't read many stories. But because Mr. Desperado and I have written a, a new novel, and just finished it very recently, of uh, military sci-fi called Diana's Fury, and this is a near-future sci-fi involving female drone pilots with some really high-tech and interesting interesting stuff going on and because because of uh, the technology because of uh, details of technology they have to be located in the war zone even though they're flying drones uh, so it's it was a lot of fun writing it and we're looking for a publisher because we believe it needs a little bit more a little bit more um, distribution than our self-published works so we really, really wanted to get the attention it deserves. So we'll let you know about the progress, our progress as that goes on. And, uh, and Richard Meyer, I hear you. <laughs> uh, he's always saying in his channel, Comics Matter, uh, creators need to promote their own work, need to not be ashamed of that. And so thanks, Richard. I'm, I'm taking your advice. So here we go with my list of stories of war. And I set out, mostly the read pretty recently, and I set out to do a survey, as I did lay, more recently with the uh, military science fiction. Not more of a top ten, but kind of a, kind of a sampling of, of very, very different styles, different viewpoints, and you know, even some of some of her tragedy, some are humor, some are some are satire, and some are. Uh, crazy fiction, some are, uh, some are non-fiction, but all in a narrative style. And so I think I did a pretty good job of, of uh, a good sampler. And I think all these books are really, really good. So I would recommend them all in various degrees. And because I'm kind of OCD, I will do these in historical order, uh, in, in order of conflict starting with the First Anglo-Afghan War, 1839-1841, which was the British Empire was trying to subdue Afghanistan and kind of add it to its, its possessions in, in the Indian subcontinent. This book is called Flashman by George MacDonald Fraser, 1969, published by Barry and Jenkins. And this is the first in a long series of uh, Flashman books. And he the character Harry Flashman is based on a character in somebody else's book, way back from 1857, uh, by Thomas Hughes, Tom Brown's School Days, in which Flashman was a nemesis. He was a bully and a coward. And I guess Fraser thought it would be fun to have him as a protagonist and have him kind of blunder through all these adventures and be hailed as a hero despite the fact that he's a coward and kind of lucks, kind of lucks into surviving. Plus, he's, he's also a pretty clever guy, too. So in this story, in this story, Flashman, he's in, he's in high school, basically, 
and it's just a boys' school as it was current at the time. And he get, takes some of his classmates out and gets them ring drunk, and himself most drunk of all. <laughs> and he gets caught and punished by expulsion. And the his father, his his mother has died, um, but his father is very angry and demands that he he go to the, go to into the army to make a man out of him. <laughs> you know, <laughs> clean him up, uh, straighten him out. And, uh, and Flashman says, well, he figures that's okay because they're aristocrats. He's going to become an officer and they'll probably just be marching around in, in England. Maybe he'll be, you know, a quartermaster or something. I mean, he's not going to risk his neck. But instead, he's sent to India <laughs> where stuff is actually going down and people are getting shot at. And uh, so it's a very... Flashman is definitely an anti-hero. He's a very... He's very much of a scoundrel, and this book would be hard to publish nowadays because he's so bad to women. He just mistreats women horribly. Uh, he's definitely, you know, he's definitely kind of a Lothario, but uh, he uh, he gets sent to Afghanistan where he becomes a lancer. You know, a guy he rides a horse and he's got a lance. In one scene, he actually spears a wild dog, showing off to one of the officers how good he is at riding and spearing. And I'm saying, oh, poor dog. <laughs> what did he do? But of course, you know, different different times. And he ends up in this horrible battle in Afghanistan, and he's one of the only survivors, and he survives because he's a coward. He runs away, and he ends up being caught by a warlord and tortured and all this good stuff. But, uh, but it's very funny if you don't mind politically incorrect humor. So I definitely recommend it. I'd probably give this one four gears just because he's such a, an unlikable guy. And, and the series goes on. He's in all these events like the Battle of Little Bighorn, which he also survives. <laughs> it's, it's crazy. But uh, they did make one movie out of the second book, which I haven't read, but I saw the movie, Royal Flash. Uh, and it was from 1975 and it starred Malcolm McDowell. It was meh. It was, that movie was definitely meh. I think, I think the book's probably better. Second book, this is something that at least my generation all heard about in high school literature class. I hadn't read it till recently though, for whatever reason. It's about the U.S. Civil War, 1861-1865. It's called The Red Badge of Courage by Stephen Crane. Published 1895 uh, and 1896 by Heinemann in the form we know it today. It's a rather short book, almost a novella. It's very, very good. It had a famous film adaptation, 1951 by John Huston, the great immortal John Huston, and a 1974 TV movie. Uh, the protagonist is Private Hem Henry Fleming. And he's in high school, just like, just like Flashman, he's in high school and uh, the, his classmates and teachers are all talking about the Union cause and uh, they get all fired up and, and a lot of them join the army. And, it, and this involves his uh, adventures in the Battle of Chancellorsville, I believe. I may be wrong, but uh, so don't, if, if I'm wrong, let me know. <laughs> but it's a, it's a short but powerful book, and it, at first, Henry is very, very bored. He's anxious to get into battle. He wants to, he wants to see blood spill and all that stuff. He's fired up. At the same time, he's worried that he might chicken out once his life is at, is at risk. And in fact, in the first battle, he does chicken out. He runs away and he has to lie about it. You know, he doesn't really shot as a deserter, you know. So, but the rest of the book is uh, him trying to redeem himself and prove that he's brave. The Red Badge of Courage, by the way, refers to a war wound. I mean, red, obviously, because you're bleeding and it's a badge of courage. You were brave enough to get yourself wounded. <laughs> so, uh, this book was so realistic that a lot of people thought Stephen Crane was in the war, even though he was born several years after the war ended. He was just a really, really good writer. Highly recommend it. Five Gears, absolutely. Let's skip forward to the First World War, 1914 and 1918. At the time, it was called The Great War. All Quiet on the Western Front by Eric Maria Remarque, published in 1929. Problem <laughs> English version was Little Brown and Company, also 1929. This was obviously from the German perspective. And remember, note that at this time, the Germans were not Nazis. This was 
uh, the German Empire versus the British Empire and uh, and France, which was also a colonial power. These guys were all colonials, uh, all were colonizers, so they were really pretty much morally equivalent. I mean, there really wasn't for all the BS about you know Germans killing babies and stuff. It was all pretty. They were all pretty much the same and just vying for power. But a very awful, bloody war. Uh, this was made into a very famous film in 1930 by Lewis Milestone. And also there was a 1979 TV film. Uh, but anyway, the protagonist of this book is uh, Paul Baumer. And he's a German uh, schoolboy, as before, as the last two times. He's, he's uh, um, cajoled into joining the war with the rest of his classmates by the professors and uh, the uh, rah-rah spirit. And he ends up it's pretty miserable. I mean, he's in the trench warfare on the Western Front over in Belgium. And uh, you see a lot of, of the extreme misery of war, you know, being shot at with machine guns, um, lice and hunger, starvation, mm -hmm. people throwing bombs into your trench. And he has all these good buddies and they're really well described. They're, they're a lot of fun. Uh, all these different characters, and uh, you know they're dying one by one. Sadly, they do have some fun times. There is some humor. They they get back at well, this really cruel officer. <laughs> they kind of they kind of put him in a bag and beat him <laughs> when you know, and he doesn't know who does it. He can never he can never prove it. But uh, so it's it's very powerful, very good. And you know, there's he does get to go home on leave occasionally and see his family, but. You know, he just, he doesn't feel appreciated that people understand what he's going through. And, and I, I can see that from a, from a veteran's, I'm not a veteran, but I have heard other, you know, veterans say such things. So, very, very good book. Five, five years, definitely. Next, we go to the Spanish Civil War. Bet you thought we were going to World War II, didn't you? No, no, we're going to stop on the way. The Spanish Civil War was fought from 1936 to 1939. For those of you who are historically challenged, this was a war between the so-called fascist uh, forces of Francisco Franco, who actually ruled until the early 1970s, Spain, and the so-called Republicans, who wanted to get rid of the king and so on. And uh, well, I'm not sure if they still had a king there, but um, anyway, the Republicans were actually backed by the communists from, from Soviet Russia. So a lot of Americans, you know, intellectuals, were kind of on the lefty side. A lot of Americans fought on the Republican side. And among the, the Americans who went there was Ernest Hemingway, who wrote this book, For Whom the Bell Tolls, published in 1940 by Charles Scribner's Sons. The title is from John Donne's famous poem. It was a British poem, poet from way back when. Ask not for whom the bell tolls, it tolls for thee. You know, referring to all our mortality, I guess. So anyway, Robert Jordan, he's an American professor from Montana, of all places, he um, quits his job, goes to Spain to fight with the guerrillas uh, for freedom <laughs> and communism. <laughs> he, oh, he ne he never says he's a communist. He he he's not. He's he's kind of iffy about that. But he joins the company of this of this fighter named Pablo, and who and uh, falls in love with a Spanish girl named Maria, who was very beautiful. But she was she was captured by the fascist, and and her ha hair was shaved off while she was in in the prison camp. And so all the men say how ugly she is because her hair is short, which is I found hilarious. But of course, Jordan knows she's beautiful. So anyway, uh, he, so he's an idealist, Robert Jordan is, and he um, he's kind of appalled by hearing all the, all the atrocities on both sides, including the Republicans who they went and, uh, like they took over this village, this was Pablo's group, took over the village, they murdered all the aristocrats, and then they murdered the priests as well because they were, you know, they were communists. They were anti-religion. Robert Jordan tries to, you know, put a little bit of a moral break on what they're doing, but it's this, his job is to blow up this, they want to blow up this bridge, but they're waiting till the fascist forces come over so they can take some of them with it. So it's very interesting, a lot of tension. Hemingway's style is famously terse, but although there isn't a lot of description, what is there is wonderful. And uh, there is more internal monologue than I expected. I mean, especially Jordan's, you know, sitting, thinking about what he's doing, if he's doing the right thing, all that stuff. Um, very moving. Again, five gears. What can, you, what can I say? Now we're going to go to the Second World War. And uh, this one, a very famous 
also. And this is a comedy. Kind of like, kind of like um, Flashman, but not so, not as dark. Catch-22 by Joseph Heller, uh, published in 1961, Simon & Schuster. It became a very famous movie uh, directed by Mike Nichols in 1970. This takes place near the end of the war on a fictional Mediterranean island uh, near Italy, or probably politically part of Italy, uh, where, the, where the Allies had, uh, you know, they were moving up Italy and they were fighting to liberate Rome and so on. And uh, this guy is a bombardier with, a, with an air crew. His name is John Yossarian, Captain John Yossarian. And uh, he is, he wants to get out. I mean, he doesn't want to, to get himself killed. So he's trying to pretend he's crazy, but that's the catch-22. Catch-22 really refers to any absurd regulation. It means if you're crazy, you'll be discharged. But if you want to get out, that proves you're not crazy because war is dangerous. <laughs> so, yeah. so he's having a difficult time of it. And there's all these insane things, this bureaucracy, really, really goofy, kind of goofy things going on. I mean, making fun of the military way they do things. So there, there's a lot of tragedy too, you know, people get, you know, people get killed, and some in gruesome ways, but uh, <clears throat> there's this particular guy, Milo Minderbinder, and it's interesting because there was a bar in the Phoenix area called Minderbinders way back when, and I, I thought that was a funny name, and I didn't realize it probably came from that. Milo Minderbinder was this scam artist who was running this syndicate who was doing this, well, this black market training, trading, and he was... He was kind of almost running the show, <laughs> uh, so uh, you know. So you know, Yossarian has a lot of dealings with him. It's definitely sat satirical. Uh, again, very funny. A lot of the type of humor as we saw in Mash, which was a book about the Korean War. Also, the long-running TV series. I haven't read the book yet, but I have seen the, that saw the movie and the series. There's this thing where Captain Pierce in Mash. All of a sudden goes kind of crazy and he says, people are trying to kill me. People are shooting at me. They want me dead. And there's the exact same scene like that in Catch-22 with Yossarian says, I think people are trying to kill me. You know, he's trying to, in, in Yossarian's case, of course, he's trying to convince people he's nuts. But a lot of that same kind of, kind of humor. Again, I would say four and a half years. Some of the, some of the humor is, gets a little over overworked perhaps, <laughs> but but still good. Uh, next one is still World War II, and this is because I do a lot of stuff on Audible and, and with my subscription there were these, you know, there's these free books. You can pick two books from this list of freebies. Pont Neuf was one of them, uh, and a World War II book, so I thought, yeah, I'll get it. My Max Bird 2020 Permuted Press. And uh, and it turned out to be pretty good. I mean, not famous, obviously, but it, this is a romance, so it's a yet another type of type of book. And Pont Neuf, it means new bridge. It's a it's a bridge in Toulouse, France, and the symbol of two worlds being joined. And it, it, it stars a female American journalist, young gal named uh, Annie March. And this is near the end of the war. It takes place forty four to forty five. What I loved about it the most was historical characters. Martha Gellhorn, who is a real-life journalist, and her husband, Ernest Hemingway. <laughs> and he's portrayed as kind of a jerk, which I believe he was. He, she was his third wife. And he's off gallivanting and playing soldier, <laughs> or trying to, even though he's a journalist, you know. And, uh, <clears throat> and the thing about Annie March is she falls in love with two different U.S. soldiers, and it's kind of a, a conflict. Which one will she choose? So... You know, a lot of tragedy, a lot of, a lot of the nuts and bolts, day-to-day -day things about war, about being in the army, and about being on the edge of a conflict, like these reporters, you know, at the edge of a com combat zone. Very, very fascinating. Highly recommend at least, at least four gears, at least. Next one, let's go to Indochina, but we're going to go to the pre predecessor, the precursor to the infamous Vietnam War. We're going to go to the first Indochina War, 1946 to 1954 between the communists called Viet Minh, for Ho Chi Minh, and the French. This one's called The Quiet American, uh, written by Graham Greene, 1955, William Heinemann. This protagonist of this one is 
Thomas Fowler, who's a British journalist based in Saigon, and he doesn't want to go back. I mean, there's some danger. You know, people get blown up by, you know, bombs lobbed at cafes and so on where American GIs are. But he's got a, he's got a cushy deal. He gets to smoke opium. And, uh, and uh, he has this lovely little Vietnamese honey named Fong. Yeah, at home, he's trapped in this awful marriage. At the time, you couldn't get divorced unless your wife gave you permission, and she refuses. <laughs> uh, so he doesn't want to go back. He meets this young American uh, named Alden Pyle, and he's with the OSS, which is the predecessor to the CIA. Well, he claims to be a trade emissary. Right, trade emissary. And so he's arranging all this stuff, and he's really like dealing with these bad characters, you know, these kind of warlords who are you know, supposed to fight the communists. And so he's a very quiet guy, very naive, very idealistic. And he, early on, he announces to Fowler that um, I'm in love with your girlfriend, and I'm going to steal her from you, steal her from you, and since you can't marry her, and I'm going to marry her. <laughs> and and you know, and he does steal her away, and which is kind of makes Paul Fowler kind of bitter. Um, but they're, he's very simple because he's Brit. And so there's there's scenes where they go out into the go out in the boonies and he's you know he's doing his reporter thing and Pyle comes out to see him and kind of helps him survive and uh, very you know brutal brutality from you know these communists would come in and if you're with the French they would basically kill everybody all all the locals who were supporting the French and some in gruesome ways and so. You know, some rather seedy things happen, but it's it's very informative about, you know, how the war is being fought and what's happening from you know, somebody on the edges of it. This was made into a famous movie in 1958 and also in, 19, in 2002. 58 was uh, directed by Joseph Mankiewicz, 2002 uh, by Philip Noyce. The Quiet American is, of course, Alden, Alden Pyle because he's so unassuming, you know, he's so naive like Boy Scout type, even though he's really involved in all this skullduggery. And very, again, I would say maybe four and a half years with this one. Very good. Skip to the U.S.-Korean War, 1950-1953. Actually, the events of this book take place before the previous, but I'm doing an order of war. So, so, so there, so there you have it. This one's called The Hunters by James Salter. 1957 Harper's Harper and Brothers. It's about fighter pilots in the Korean War. It's semi-autobiographical um, by the 1952 experiences of the author, uh, whose real name was James Horowitz. I suppose Salter was kind of a more of a macho <laughs> type, white bread American name. Uh, and the hero is Captain Cleve Connell. He's one of uh, a bunch of American fighter pilots based, I don't remember exactly where, if it's Seoul or whatnot, I don't remember. I think they're more out in the boonies. And uh, they are fighting the North Koreans, who of course have flying, the, flying Russian MiGs. And there's this one guy called, they call Casey Jones, because they fly in these formations called, the Americans call trains, and he's like a train engineer, so that's his nickname. So the whole idea is to shoot down the enemy and become an ace. I think you needed, what, six? Kills, I forget exactly how many it was. But uh, one of Connell's biggest agonies is that he has only shot down like one, and he really, really wants to be an ace. And it's just so, kind of a competition between all these guys, some of which, you know, one of the guys who becomes an ace, I forget his name, but he's an absolute jerk. And he, like, he actually um, risks his wingman's life just so he can get another kill. Which is not necessarily a kill, because even if the enemy bails out, it counts, as long as you destroy the plane. This was made into a 1958 film directed by Dick Powell, starring Richard, Robert Mitchum and Robert Wagner. Talk about macho American styles, stars. So, book very good. A little bit, a little bit slower than you'd expect. So I would give it about four gears, but nonetheless very good. Now let's go to the real Vietnam War, the war, the war that Americans were fighting in from 1955 to 1975, believe it or not. Uh, this is called The Things They Carried by Tim O'Brien, 1990 Houghton Mifflin. 
and it's a series of interconnected stories of the war and afterwards, and a few of the author's childhood, because these are these are very these are semi-autobiographical as well, because he was in the war, he was drafted, he was a very liberal guy, he actually considered uh, going to Canada and, and, and bowing out, so to speak, but he changed his mind at the last minute. He was afraid everybody would hate him for it, um, and uh, so all the things that happened in the bush and all the some of the horrible things that happened, some of the funny things that happened, and the ironic things, and a, a very interesting cast of characters. I think mostly based on real people: uh, Lieutenant Jimmy Cross, uh, Rat Kiley, Armand Bowker, who was a real person uh, from Iowa, and Kiowa, who was like a Native American from Oklahoma, a very devout Christian, very cool guy. And one of my favorite stories in this was. Uh, the Sweetheart of the Song Trabong, which was made into a 1958 TV film starring Kiefer Sutherland, believe it or not, and uh, which I had not heard of. But this is a case, this is one of Rat Kylie's stories that none of the other guys believes. But he's a medic, so he was over at this one medical, this hospital base, and he claimed that one of the guys saved up his money, one of the GIs saved up his money and had his girlfriend shipped over from the States. A pretty little blonde, fresh out of high school, 17-year-old from, from, from Ohio, <laughs> to, so he could be with, with him at this medical base. And uh, so it's not as dangerous, you know, they'll lob mortars in and stuff, but mostly it's pretty safe. But, you know, the, the arrogance, <laughs> the audacity, unless that's the word, the audacity of him sending his girlfriend. And she, and there's also, near, near this hospital, there's, always, there's also this, this little base, they call every, every dwelling, they call it a hooch. But the, the, the Green Berets, like there's I think seven of them, they have the hooch nearby and they're very secretive and very uh, quiet. And so this girlfriend starts disappearing after she's been there a, a couple of weeks because she's become bored. And, and he thinks she's cheating on him because there's all these guys, all these, these uh, sexually frustrated guys out here. Well, it turns out She's not cheating on him. She's running out missions with the Green Beret. She's cut off her nice blonde hair. She's wearing a, a, um, a bandana. She's in camo. She's carrying a rifle. She's going out in midnight ambushes. <laughs> and, and she's the sweetheart, basically, of the Song Trabong, which is the name of the base. And a fantastic story. Whether it was true or not, who knows? Uh, but, yeah, some of these stories are very uh, funny, some of them are very sad. One really tore me up about Norman Bowker, about what happened to him after he came home. Um, just choked me up just thinking about it now. <laughs> but anyway, um, uh, highly recommended, five years. Five years, no, hands down, five years. I would give it more than five years <laughs> if I wanted to break my rating system. Finally, we'll go with one that was completely nonfiction. Uh, it's something that we've definitely heard of. Uh, this is the Battle of Mogadishu, which took place in Somalia in 1993 with American troops being being stranded in hostile territory, uh, uh, well known, also known as the Battle of the Black Sea, Black Hawk Down, <laughs> uh, by Mark Bowden, 1999. Uh, Signet Books became a very famous film in 2001, director Ridley Scott. And uh, this was definitely, this was an award-winning book, or a finalist at least. And it first ran as a 29-part series in the Philadelphia Inquirer. And that's actually what Bowker was a reporter for the Philadelphia Inquirer. And he became fascinated with, uh, the, became fascinated with the experience of the men in Somalia. And he, was, he found nobody had really told their story. A lot of guys died in this botched raid. Because um, they were trying to get this warlord, uh, Far Ardid, the whole idea was to bring you know, order to Somalia, and the idea was to take down the warlords. Well, this this raid didn't go well. Two choppers were 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 knocked down, and the the populace was very hostile, and they had to fight their way out. And even the rescuers, a lot of them died. And uh, so this was the U.S. Army Rangers, who are elite troops, and the Delta Force, even more elite, kind of like the Green Berets. I mean, they're they're um, elite special ops people, and kind of arrogant, and their arrogance costs them several lives. Uh, but anyway, what the reason 
And uh, the cool thing is, is that he also gives the Somali point of view, Baldwin does. He interviewed several Somalis about it. And the reason the Somalis hated us so much was because of this raid they'd done. There was this house where a lot of the um, warlords were meeting. And so they, <clears throat> so the U.S. figured, oh, let's just take care of them all. And they fired a whole bunch of rockets into this. Killed everybody in there. Pretty much everybody. Well, as it turns out, this was a meeting of the clans. And uh, so every, pretty much every clan in that part of Somalia had a grudge. Now, so they all hated the Americans. As much as they'd been fighting amongst each other, they hated the Americans worse. So that was kind of a definite miscalculation. And, you know, and after this disaster, you know, President Clinton decided to pull out U.S. troops, even though a lot of guys were, were saying, well, now we've, we've sacrificed all these lives. Now it's not, it's for, for nothing. <laughs> and although I.D. did end up getting killed in fighting between clans uh, just a few years later. So it's a, it's a very graphic and sometimes heartbreaking story. All the guys that survived, all the guys that, that uh, died, and uh, Somalis as well, many, many, many Somalis died. And because uh, they were like fearless, they would come out, even the women would come out, women and children would be coming out in these crowds that were trying to kill the Americans. And so even though Bowden is kind of critical in places about the military, uh, it, the, the, actually it turns out the military loves it and it's required reading in some of the war colleges. And it should be required reading as well for anybody who's considering joining the military because this is what could happen. I mean, this is the kind of things that can happen. Also very fascinating about battlefield medicine, a lot of uh, amazing ways they try to save lives on the battlefield. Amazing. So, this has been my survey of several works, several stories of war, works of fiction and nonfiction, of a, a range of history. And I hope you liked it. I hope you, I hope you learned something. And I hope, if you haven't, did you check out some of these books and, or perhaps the movies that were made out of them at least so you know a little bit more about our history and about, well, I guess, British and Spanish history as well. And uh, you'd be a little bit well, more well-informed. We will, of course, keep you informed as well about Diana Syria, about her progress in trying to get, us, get it published as far as uh, finding a way to get it a little bit more notice distribution. Thank you very much for sticking with me on this survey of stories of war. Uh, I'm the Steampunk Desperado. Please like and share. That helps us a lot. And for, for today, this is me saying adios amigos from the Steampunk Desperado channel, where the past meets the future and the present is extraordinary. <laughs>